your book uh, makes the claim that the attacks are a turning point. And as Norman Finkelstein also made the claim in his book uh, the previous year that the war in Gaza was a turning point. So at this point in time, I'm just wondering what evidence you have seen um, for that claim mm -hmm. uh, that there has been a definitive shift in the balance of political uh, affairs in Palestine and Israel rather than just this, this attack being one more uh, in a series of acts of illegality executed with impunity, which is, has a long history, as Noam pointed out. So in other words, if you have uh, so many, too many turning points, you keep turning until you're just back to where you were. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it's a treacherous road to try to predict, I think, where the real turning points will be. Um, but I think that there, were, there, are, there are some reasons to think that on the, in the long history of the struggle that these are significant milestones, these are significant markers along the way. I think that um, the war in Gaza, where Gaza was sealed off and bombed mercilessly, uh, really, really shocked the conscience of so many people around the world. Maybe not in the United States, as, as Noam was saying. Uh, but I think that, that it became a lot harder to defend, to reflexively defend the actions of Israel after the war in Gaza in particular. And then came the blockade. Um, well, the bucket was there before, but then came uh, um, uh, the attack on the Mavi Marmara. And then uh, you get the, the settlement building, as you say, as an attempt to change the narrative. But going back to, uh, to what all the panelists have been saying, you know, maybe not, maybe there are a lot of different uh, uh, markers along the way. And it's maybe perhaps more important to think about the chipping away of the narrative rather than a real turning point, rather than a moment where, it's going, where you can say, ah, here's where it happened. I think that there's been a lack of, there, there's been a moment where we, we're coming upon these increasing moments where the ability uh, to narrate events is being questioned uh, from the part of Israel and, and the United States alone. And a lot of that does have to do with, you know, I'm not, with new media, and I'm actually, I kind of hate the people who celebrate new media because I feel like it's a way of, of diminishing the role of people in action. Uh, but by the same token, it does offer a lot of opportunity for, for blogs to put in, uh, important information out there, like what Max does or like what Mondo Weiss does. Uh, I think that um, there's a lot of interest around the world in this struggle, and people are looking at it in new ways, in new, in, in new light, because of all of these different things. Um, so as an example of that, there's a South African edition of the book that's just recently appeared. And South African activists are actually very interested in what's going on in Palestine. I mean, here, the, the, there's a lot of controversy as soon as you raise the word apartheid when you're talking about Israel and Palestine. And yet, it's the South Africans who are the ones who are the most uh, uh, willing to use the word. I think that should teach us a lot already. So I think, and then at, by the same token, I'm afraid you have this, the, the nexus of Christian Zionism and a very conservative pro-Israel uh, sentiment in the United States too. So you have groups like the ADL shooting themselves in the foot, if you ask me. For what, as an example, uh, in the summertime when, you, when there was the, the, all the controversy around the, uh, the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, which is not a mosque and not a Ground Zero. Uh, and uh, then you had uh, Abe Foxman of the ADL saying that, that, that he understood the idea of not having the mosque. That this is supposed to be an organization that would stand up for the civil rights of persecuted minorities or weaker minorities. And uh, so that just seems to me to be very flat-footed. I think that there's a way in which also uh, Rashid Khalidi makes this point that uh, if you look at the New York Times, for example, there's a big difference between someone like Robert Mackey, who's writing the lead, and uh, the kinds of information that you get online from the New York Times, even the New York Times, versus the, the paper version of the New York Times, and the articles that can link there and all that sort of stuff. There's, it's a lot harder to sustain a narrative today, and it's probably going to be in increasingly more difficult to sustain these kinds of narratives. So maybe turning point is the wrong word. Maybe uh, uh, how it changed the course, maybe it should have been how it may change the course. Uh, uh, but, um, but I think it's important to see 
the, the changes over, over a length of time. Max, political legacy. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Mustafa is saying. Um, I think the worse it gets inside Israel and Palestine, uh, the better our discussion gets. Um, the more people, I mean, I'm part of the, I guess, the class of uh, 09, 08, when uh, on the first day of uh, Operation Cast Lead, when they named a War of Annihilation after a toy I used to play with as a kid, uh, I decided I was going to direct my journalistic energy into uh, doing something about this, into uh, scrutinizing this country and its project um, to dispossess the Palestinians and uh, ultimately to damage uh, the lives of its own citizens. Um, I want to talk about concrete steps that can be taken, not just words, but actions that can be taken to hold um, Israel accountable. Um, I think Israel's greatest fear, um, it has a lot of fears. It's a fear-based society. Avi Benyahu, who I mentioned earlier, said one of the greatest, the third greatest threat to Israel is Facebook. So they fear that just as Mubarak did. They fear the Goldstone Report. And they also fear BDS, the movement to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel. Um, but they've had this fear ever since Nuremberg. Now, how were the um, criminals who were tried at Nuremberg um, prosecuted and convicted? They left a paper trail. That was just a big problem for them. So um, in 1947, when Israel began, or the um, uh, Zionist movement began its process of ethnically cleansing um, the Palestinians, out of um, Palestine um, to carve out space for its new state. Um, Ben-Gurion uh, consciously sought to do this without leaving a paper trail. Um, a general named Benjamin Dunkelman, who had moved to Israel from Canada, um, who was a committed Zionist, was charged with um, conquering Nazareth. He, he, he went to the, um, the authority, the, um, the mayor of Nazareth, and said, look, you have no means of resisting us. The Arab Liberation Army's gone. Uh, let's just work this out. So they worked out a deal. And then he received orders to expel the population by force um, from a general named uh, Carmel. He said, I'm not, why do I have to do this? We, we've already settled this. Um, he said, these orders are coming from on high. That means they're coming from Ben-Gurion. And he said, OK, show me them in writing. They never came. That's why the Palestinian population of Nazareth is still there today. Ramle and Lida, which is now Lud and Ramle, um, were mostly ethnically cleansed after Ben-Gurion gave a signal to Yigal Alon. Why did he do that? Because he didn't want to put it in writing. Uh, they didn't have the US on their side the way they do today. They didn't have the same um, Israel lobby alliance. And so they had to avoid keeping a paper trail. But now we not only have a paper trail, we have a video um, today, which I just posted on my blog, of the Jewish National Fund and an end times broadcasting network named God TV, eth uh, um, firing um, tear gas projectiles and beanbag rounds at children of the Bedouin village of Al Arakib in the Negev, who are Israeli citizens because they want to ethnically cleanse this area in order to build a non native forest, soon to be named God TV Forest. And we have a means of holding the Jewish National Fund accountable for doing this. This is what they did in the 1930s. Um, this is what they've been doing all along. They've been engaged in ethnic cleansing through any means. And now it's, they have to use more violence. And uh, they've had to destroy this village 17 times because the people keep resisting, because they're joined um, by Jewish activists from Israel, and because we're scrutinizing them. And they're terrified. Um, so the, uh, Noam had mentioned that you know, we, we can do something about US crimes. We already are doing something about Israeli crimes. The BDS movement has gotten the company Veolia to pull out of the Jerusalem rail line, which goes into the heart of the Jordan Valley. The BDS movement um, has forced Lev Levayev, the blood diamond millionaire, to stop building settlements in the West Bank. Um, the BDS movement is pressuring Ahava to pull its factory out of the occupied West Bank. The BDS movement has removed has done more against the settlements than the peace process. Um, and it's, the BDS call comes from Palestinian civil society. 170 Palestinian civil society organizations are asking you to stop complying with the occupation. You don't have to comply with the occupation. Um, after the flotilla, after events like Cast Lead, the BDS movement began gaining strength when people realized um, that what Israel 
says, what Israel's essential message is, is that might makes right. And that our response as citizens of the world who've been basically denied a response by our own government is to say that rights make might. By the way, the latest target is Brian Ferry, uh, who's, play, who's scheduled to play. Yeah, and Macy Gray just had a really ugly affair uh, after <laughs> criticizing Israel, then agreeing to play there. Uh -huh. no, I don't know why anyone wants to hear her anyway. But. <laughs> well, uh, let me pick up again on your comments. Uh, you're quite right about the Jewish National Fund. Uh, the Jewish National Fund is, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's not the BDS movement alone that's uh, talking about this. So Human Rights Watch, pretty conservative organization, which has very much been very careful about not criticizing Israel too harshly. Now, they came out with a report recently, which I don't even think was reported in the press, but an important one, which told us something we can do. Uh, they said that the United States, they called on the United States government to stop any kind of involvement in any settlement, in any activities in the occupied territories. And they also called on the government to look into the tax-free status of organizations in the United States that claim to be doing humanitarian work in Israel and see if they are actually uh, uh, qualify for tax-free status. That's pretty serious. And that's something that we accurately called ethnic cleansing in the uh, Bedouin areas. It has been going on for years. Uh, 20 years ago, I visited the towns in the Bedouin areas where uh, people had been rounded up and forced into uh, their, they live in the, you know, they have uh, sheep and goats, they live in the open spaces, had been forced into an air, urban area where they can't survive. That was 20 years ago. The Jewish National Fund uh, is, first of all, involved illegally in the occupied territories, but even within Israel, uh, it's, uh, it operates under a charter uh, granted by the government of Israel um, 50 years ago, 1953, which requires it to act uh, only in the interests of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. Uh, that means in the state of Israel. Uh, there are other people there. And they're not a minor organization through a variety of laws and administrative practices, they had effective control of over about 90% of the land, which meant that that land was effectively restricted to people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. Well, is that a tax-free organization, uh, quite apart from uh, their activities in the occupied territories? Now, uh, somebody, Mustafa, or someone said that, uh, maybe you, that uh, Israel has, uh, succeeded in shifting the uh, narrative towards settlement expansion and away from the fundamental issues. I'd like to add a small qualification to that. Uh, Israel's tried to shift it, but it's the Obama administration that shifted it. They're the ones who succeeded in shifting the discussion to settlement expansion, which is a footnote. I mean, it's the settlements that are criminal. Expanding the settlements is l really a footnote. But that's the issue when the Obama administration makes its empty gestures and it makes sure that Netanyahu understands they're empty by saying they're purely symbolic, as their term. Uh, it's about settlement expansion. And even on that, they're blocking it. Right now, at the United Nations Security Council, this minute, there's a resolution brought by Lebanon uh, with the support of about 120 governments last time I looked, uh, asking the Security Council to pass a resolution uh, de declaring settlement expansion illegitimate. That's the official policy of the U.S. The Obama administration has made it very clear that if that uh, resolution comes through, they're going to veto it. Okay. Well, that's happening right before our eyes. Uh, talk about things we can do. Uh, Amnesty International, you know, also not an extremist organization, although I might add that at Ben-Gurion Airport uh, in Israel, Israel's main airport, uh, if, you try, if you're trying to get on the internet, uh, you can't access uh, the uh, hmm. website for Human Rights Watch and, and, and Amnesty International. They're blocked 
as hostile organizations. Uh, but uh, Amnesty International, right during Operation Cast Lead, uh, came out with a call to the U.S. government to terminate all arms shipments to Israel uh, because they are in violation of international law. And they could have added they're also in violation of U.S. law, which requires that uh, any transfer of arms be for uh, the purpose of self-defense or in, in internal order, and certainly this was neither of those. Well, nobody picked that up and acted on it. But those are all things we can quite definitely do. And uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the main thing we have to do, I think, is to break through the uh, denial uh, over the fact that the Israeli crimes, uh, since 1967 certainly, are U.S. crimes. They cannot continue without essential, decisive U.S. support and that includes the kind of doctrinal support that uh, allows the suppression and distortion and misrepresentation representation to succeed without a propaganda agency, much worse than when there is one. Can I ask at this point, uh, if you have any questions, just to jot them in your index cards, and Alex, could you maybe collect them so that we have some questions from the floor in, in just a few minutes? And um, in the meantime, Susan, I wanted you to, to just uh, uh, start off the round of... Uh, the third question. Yeah. yeah. That's what I think is a good idea. Um, I, because I think this, the, the third question, just to remind you what it is, your opinion of how recent events in the Middle East, especially Tunisia and Egypt, may or may not have changed the geopolitical balance in the region. I think this is crucial because when... Uh, when we look at the political legacy of these attacks, it seems to me it's not just going to be um, flotilla uh, Palestine, flotilla Israel uh, story. It's going to be a total reconfiguration of of the power of people in um, the Eastern Mediterranean. I, I, I'm sure that that is happening. I mean, uh, so it, it's not going to happen by, in, there, there are several things I want to say uh, to make that specific. One is it seemed to me that Al Jazeera English is uh, like a window to the world that we have been lacking for a long time, and that surely is going to get on uh, the broadcast possibilities because the reporting was just terrific and uh, so necessary uh, for uh, U.S. citizens and so pleasant to to have streaming live with no advertisements, no one telling you that you're going to waste 10 or 15 seconds of your life before you can get the information you want. So that, I think, is a, was just a, a, a real sense of, of relief, uh, 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 just to have that as a source of information. Um, and in the process, of course, the, the, uh, the narratives just don't hold. So you have, of course, you have the US-Israeli narrative, but it doesn't hold. It's a minor narrative. It's over here in the corner suddenly, and there's something else so much more important happening. So in a way, who cares what Obama says? And you didn't care. That wasn't, oh my gosh, how is Obama going to react? No, no, you had no, you had very, you had some concern with uh, whether the United States was going, how long the United States and how powerfully the United States was going to try to back Mubarak. But you didn't ask what the U.S. government was saying about it. You, you really didn't trust it. And, you know, th as far as being afraid that this was Iran all over again, it wasn't Iran of the 79 revolution. It was you were elated because this might be Iran of the 2009, was it, uh, opposition to an unfair election. That's the Iran that was being echoed uh, in Egypt. And so you had a, an entirely different set of events in which then, um, of course, the United States came out very clearly. And the last, the last point of the military is that we will honor all uh, uh, external treaties, which means precisely the treaty to uh, rec recognize Israel's right to exist. Um, and we don't know how powerful the military is going to be. We don't know how, how clearly it's going to go over into the democratic camp. But it seems to me that the story is simply not about Israel and the United States anymore. 
It is a much wider story, and that is a subplot where it's almost as a consequence of what's happening afterwards that you get uh, some, some idea of what's happening there. And so you do have people having power. I mean, you do have a sense that these movements matter. They matter more than, I mean, the, the other, I hate to do this like image stuff, but I do a lot of this juxtaposition. And it's not just Zizek and, and Ramadan, but it's also Mubarak giving this speech saying, I am your father, I understand you children. And it's the people out in the square are shaking their shoes and saying, you know, quit. I mean, he suddenly, he, he looked like a fool. I, he did, and I, I, I think he probably believed he was being sincere, but he had lost it. He had lost it, and, uh, and the next day he stepped down. The one other thing I want to say, Saba Mahmoud, whose uh, who's, uh, intelligence I, I totally value, and certainly her knowledge of Egypt, um, echoes what a lot of other people are saying, which is what you really have to watch is, you know, when did people just say, we, or when did power just say, we can't let this go on any further in Egypt. It's when strikes were threatened. It's when the Suez Canal might have been closed. We're back, ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, in uh, a necessity to criticize global capital and its restructuring. That, 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 you know, and that doesn't mean that we should be Marxists in some sort of classical sense, but it is people who don't have uh, enough food and who don't have jobs who are the bulk of the support for the brave young new generation with their high technology who did what they did in Tunis uh, or Tunisia and in, in Egypt. That's, uh, but it's people who are hungry and people who are poor. And you know, that is a problem in um, the United States more and more because of restructuring that's sitting home. And that is a kind of universal situation. So somehow or other, we have to be talking about a global economy again and doing a critique um, of the global economy because we can remember inspiring moments. And this is, I, I, I will finish. I, we can remember inspiring moments of people on the square, but they are moments. They are moments, and they will not hold unless there is structural reform, um, both political and economic. And there, it's a global, it's a global struggle. It is not a purely uh, Egyptian struggle or Palestinian struggle or Israeli struggle. Moi? Oh. Um. I was just, as I said, um, in Israel and Palestine, so I can tell you a little bit about the reaction of people, the um, polarized reactions um, to the Egyptian uprising, or hopefully we can call it a revolution. Um, in the cafes in Ramallah and Bethlehem, people are quietly elated. Of course, they, I mean, the, the villages involved in the popular struggle that come out in protest every Friday had a solidarity demonstration uh, with Egypt. and you know, had to abandon their um, Egyptian flags under massive clouds of tear gas. But in the cities, um, people are, can, are not going to follow the model and rise up against the PA. They're simply too exhausted after the second intifada. Um, and so it all goes back to the um, Palestinian axiom, which is that the road to Jerusalem runs through Arab capitals, and that's what people are hopeful about there. On the, on the Israeli side, I mean, the military intelligence apparatus is simply terrified. Um, not just that, that uh, Egypt will fail to uphold the Camp David Treaty, but also that it might you know, open up the Rafah crossing in Gaza um, and start sabotaging this uh, inhuman siege, which is massively unpopular in Egypt. Uh, Benjamin Ben Eliezer, um, the grand old man of the Labor Party, the moribund Labor Party, was on the phone every day with Mubarak trying to uh, console him. Um, and he's beside himself. And one of the most remarkable reactions of Israelis was total indifference. That I would walk through Tel Aviv, you know, this, this incredible historical event is happening just miles away, and people are just completely indifferent. They're not a part of it. It's not their world. They're in Europe. They're facing Europe. The Arab world is this far away thing. And when there was a protest in, or a, a solidarity demonstration in North Tel Aviv with people waving Palestinian flags, 
Um, they, uh, my friend David Sheen filmed it. You can see his video online of interviewing uh, North Tel Avivians. This is where the Ashkenazi elite lives. And they were just really upset that foreign flags were flying in their city. Um, that was sort of the reaction. I mean, we wish the Egyptians well, but why do they have to fly these foreign Palestinian flags here? Um, which really shows, uh, I think, the, the polarization not just between Palestinians in the West Bank, but Palestinians inside Israel and Israelis. Uh, as my friend um, Sami Shahada, who's um, the, one of the uh, leaders of the popular committee in Jaffa, told me, um, you know, my dream is to have lunch in Damascus and dinner in Beirut. Us, that's the difference between us and the Jewish Israelis. We love the Arab world, and they want to go to Berlin and have a vacation. Um, so this was really exposed. Another thing that was exposed is the extent to which um, Israel has historically sought to destabilize Egypt by propping up people like Mubarak um, and, and the fear they have of Jordan collapsing because it was, of course, uh, King Abdullah who negotiated with Ben-Gurion during the 48 war um, to basically allow, to not, not go over the Green Line, not assist the Arab Liberation Army, take uh, what is the West Bank and deny the Palestinians a state, um, which is why he was assassinated by a Palestinian, because he had sold them out. Um, and so that's coming in the future. Um, in, with Egypt, I mean, you have events like the Levant Affair in 1954, where Israel actually trained a group of Egyptian Jews um, from Alexandria in sabotage and bomb planting techniques, and then um, had them plant bombs in a movie theater, continue occupying the Suez Canal, because they were terrified that um, Nasser and Egypt would begin to modernize. In fact, uh, that year, Anthony Nutting, the um, defense minister for um, Anthony Eden, then the prime minister of England, went and visited with Nasser. Um, and he came back and met with Ben-Gurion, and he told Ben-Gurion, Nasser doesn't want to destroy you. He's not the Nazi that you're making him out to be. He just wants to modernize Egypt and move it forward. And Ben-Gurion said, and you call that a good thing? This is in uh, Saeed Abu Rish's biography of Nasser, by the way. Um, so you, that is really the basis of the Israeli fear, um, is that Egypt will modernize and that, seemed, in their mind, um, threatens them, which is really uh, troubling and speaks volumes about the Zionist project. Well, if I can just comment again, it also speaks uh libraries about the U.S. project, of which the Zionist project is a footnote. I mean, Israel could do those things because the U.S. was entirely behind it, every one of those cases. Uh, uh, it was here in the United States that Nasser was compared with Hitler by John Foster Dulles. Uh, back in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration, we ought to learn something about our own history. In the 1950s, uh, the Eisenhower, President Eisenhower consulted with his staff on why there is what he called a campaign of hatred against us among the people in the Arab world. Not the governments, they're okay, but the people. And the National Security Council uh, came out with a memorandum, it's the highest planning body, it's been declassified for years, in which they said there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports uh, harsh and brutal dictators and uh, blocks democracy and development. And we do that because uh, we want to maintain control over their energy resources. And in fact, Nasser was Hitler because he was uh, talking about whether he was going to do it or not, uh, using the resources of the region for uh, their own populations, uh, not for Western oil companies and uh, super rich. Uh, uh, gangsters in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then the Security Council went on to say, yeah, the perception is pretty much accurate, and that's what we ought to be doing. And that's what we've been doing ever since, and are still doing, uh, right at this minute. And so, for example, those of you who've looked at uh, WikiLeaks, uh, I'm sure you all have, uh, must have noticed that the, uh, the revelation that got the big headlines in the United States was this uh, euphoric reaction to the uh, discovery from WikiLeaks that uh, the Arabs uh, support us in our attitude towards Iran. Well, who supports us? Uh, the claim is that several Arab dictators support us. Uh, what about the population? Well, see, we don't have a censorship system here. 
so you can count on the media to provide zero reporting. Last time I had somebody check. Zero reporting of the fact that last August a major study was released on Arab public opinion by the Brookings Institute, a very prominent institute and top pollsters. And it said something about the Arab people think about this. Well, it turns out that among the Arab population, about 10% think that Iran is a threat. Uh, roughly 80 to 90% regard the US and Israel as the major threats. In fact, uh, opposition to US policy is so extreme that the majority think the region would be better off if Iran had nuclear weapons. But as long as the people are subdued and quiet, it really doesn't matter. We can, the dictator support us and what, what else ma matters? Uh, just as in the 1950s, uh, just as anywhere else in the world, just as domestically inside the United States. As long as people are quiet and passive, you can, you know, uh, the CEO of uh, the Goldman Sachs can just get a $12.5 million uh, bonus, as he did a couple of days ago, and have his base salary quadrupled as a few days ago, already astronomical, while uh, you're attacking uh, pensions for teachers and police. As long as the population's quiet, yeah, we can continue just as uh, in, in uh, the Middle East, just as in Latin America, just as everywhere. Uh, those are critical facts and we have to face them uh, about ourselves. In fact, I'd urge you to take a look carefully at an interesting issue of the New York Times, February 12th. On February 12th, there was this huge headline in the front, Mubarak leaves. And then there was a subheading that said uh, uh, Arab uh, military, Arab armies take over Egypt. Actually, they were a little late. They took it over in 1952. But anyway, <laughs> uh, better late than never. Uh, and, and then it goes on you know, to talk about um, the threats, uh, you know, radical Islam and so on. You go back to an inside page, and there's a story about the state of Wisconsin where the new Republican governor announced that he wants to be in the lead in the, he didn't put it in these words, but it's what it amounts to. He wants to be in the lead on expanding the attack on the general population and enriching uh, the uh, crooks who, the banks and the investment firms that drove us into the depression, recent depression for most of the population. And the way he's gonna do it is by, he explained how, uh, there's a huge wave of uh, propaganda now about blaming the financial crisis and not on Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase and Citigroup and their friends in the White House and so on, uh, but rather on uh, teachers, uh, police, uh, firefighters, uh, all these people with their huge salaries and their immense pensions and you know Cadillac health care plans and uh, draining money from the taxpayer all because of these unions which are doing all these things. And it's pretty effective. And uh, the governor, Governor Walker in Wisconsin, said, yeah, we're going to go after that. No more collective bargaining, no more pensions, and if people don't like it, we're going to call out the National Guard. Okay, that's on an inside page of the Times. The front page says, uh, you know, Army took over 60 years ago. But, uh, uh, but the, uh, unless there's a democratic <coughs> uprising here, uh, there isn't going to be much chance for the people elsewhere who are uh, uh, struggling courageously. What they're doing is inspiring, and we should recognize that, but we can't overlook the fact that what the U.S. and Europe do, and it's Europe too, is very uh, significant. Uh, let's uh, take Europe. Uh, in North Africa, the worst criminals are not the United States, the France. Uh, this uh, uprising uh, that's taken over in the Arab world. That actually began last November. In November, there was a significant uprising in uh, Western Sahara, which was conquered by Morocco uh, 20, 30 years ago. Brutal, vicious attack. It's been murderous ever since. But there was a popular uprising in uh, uh, Western Sahara, the Sahrawis, the tent cities formed and so on. And the Moroccan government, came in and violently and brutally destroyed it. Well, there was an effort to um, 
have an investigation at the United Nations. France blocked it. France is not going is going to protect its uh, uh, its dictators in, in northern Africa. In fact, France is the one who was mostly involved in uh, supporting Ben Ali in Tunisia. That's their domain. So we've got our own crimes. They've got theirs. Uh, but as long as uh, the U.S. and Europe uh, s stay on their path, uh, the their, what people do elsewhere is highly significant. As go I agree, it's going to change the future in unpredictable ways, but it's going to be limited. And we can do something about what happens here. The French can do something about what happens in France. We can, we can applaud what happens in Tahrir Square, but can't do much about it. Okay, we have... Um